nervous this morning. I haven't spoken to a, a group of people in quite a while. It seems like it's not working for you. I'm going to smack you again. <laughs> Testing one, two. Can you crank me up, sir? I'm a little weak of voice. Thank you. You tell me. Yes? Yes? I'm looking at Stan. You good? <clears throat> so as we were uh, taking the communion service together, it reminded me of a statement that Jesus had made in Luke 22, where he had sent him off to go find, <clears throat> find the upper room. And in that upper room, there uh, it was a, the supper was prepared. And Jesus told him, I had earnestly desired to have this supper with you. Folks, it's been a long time since I've been able to have communion with you all. And with you who are new here or haven't been here in a while, Paul, um, it is so good to, to, have, uh, to have you here. And Max, it's good to see you here uh, in, on a Sunday morning. And, and all of you all, all of you all, it's just fantastic. Uh, we had an experience uh, recently, as uh, I believe Fred brought it out, that there was a group, uh, Cornerstone Church in Kansas City, Kansas, in Kansas City is in Kansas, right? Okay, I was going to say Kansas City, Missouri. That, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, there's Kansas City. There is a Kansas City, Missouri? Yeah. They, these guys were from Kansas, though, right? I'm pretty Missouri. sure they were. Missouri. They were from Missouri? Yeah. I stand corrected. First thing I do, preach, and I preach false doctrine already. <laughs> just right out of the side of my mouth. <laughs> Kansas City, Missouri is where they came from. And... Uh, I didn't check their driver's license, but they were some awfully fine people. Yeah. And they had really uh, had a spirit of giving and not receiving. We, Majel and I, have, were privileged to have a few, uh, four of them, in our house. Uh, the arrangements were made uh, afar off on the telephone, having never met. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever done that? Gone ahead and called somebody or talked to them on the phone and, and said, I, they said, I need a, set, a place to stay. And uh, I've got a couple extra rooms. I'll, I'll take the office and put a blow-up mattress on the floor. And if you've got somebody that's got a good back and doesn't mind ruining it for a night or two. Anyway, they were here uh, from Sunday night all the way through to Thursday night. Friday morning they left uh, to go back home. Some of them went different directions. But what an experience it was for our church. Now, we were, we were not the object of their mission. We were just the host church of the object of their mission. The Faith Tabernacle, which is a Haitian Creole speaking mission or church, uh, rents space from us. And we are glad to assist them in their worship and in their reaching souls for Christ that do not speak English or speak Creole. Amen. And uh, they, yeah, they just uh, assist in a different way. Their doctrine is slightly different from us and we'll let God handle all that. I'm not going to get in the middle of all that, but um, it was quite an experience to see that we are the third person in this enterprise, and yet we were greatly blessed, greatly blessed. I was blessed. Uh, I went to the hospital um, on uh, a couple times recently. You probably know because Michelle's so good about getting you all information. But one time they were here in our house, and I. I had to go. I had uh, some heart, some, and so when I got to the hospital, uh, spent the night in the ICU, and went ahead and um, sent me up to the ICU with a with a set of doctors that was going to put a scope in my throat to look at my heart. And the the thing was, my heartbeat was around 135 to 145 a minute, which, if you know, that's I mean, hummingbirds aren't even that. I don't think I don't maybe, but I, I was up there. I was pretty bad. Could have, could have had a heart attack or stroke. So in the meantime, that's not the fun part of the story. The fun part of the story is the mission people were meeting in our sanctuary here. Uh, that morning, that was a... Damn, I'm losing it. Friday? Was it? No, it wasn't Friday. Or Wednesday. Wednesday. And uh, so the doctors were surrounding me in my room, and we're going to come in and put this scope... They had the anesthesiologist. It's supposed to be hurt. It's supposed to hurt. So you, you got to go to, to sleep. So they had the anesthesiologist there. They had gotten my permission. I had signed the thing, you know. If you kill me, it's okay. 
You know that form you have to find, fill out? Anybody have to sign one of those? I'm telling you, it's a little, you know, it's, you get a little anxiety sometimes. But I signed it, I don't care. I'm, I'm wanting to go up there anyway. So the, the, uh, the doctor came in and uh, they were meeting in here in that, that morning and I was in the hospital about to get a procedure that was dangerous. And the doctor looked at me that was in charge of all these staff and people. It was six, seven people plus the anesthesiologist. And the, the, he, the doctor looked at me and then he looked up at the beep, 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 and blah, and all, all that was going on the screen. And he said, okay, that's everybody out of here. We don't need this guy. I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa what happened? Did I, did I trip a wire? What, what, what happened here? He said, nope. He said, we, we can't help you. I said, what do you mean? You can't help me. He said, you're normal. I said, what? He said, yeah, you went from 145 down to 65, and there's nothing I can do for you. Your heartbeat is normal. And it was, it was so, so I came, so I got discharged. That, the good news was I was discharged. I wanted to go home. And when I got home, when I got home, they had a group uh, dinner. We came straight from the hospital over to the dinner because I was hungry, you know, so it was good. <laughs> they had in fellowship while they had dinner going. And uh, so as we were eating the dinner, I was telling one of the guys from Kansas my story that I had just done that, wow, they, they didn't even scope me. I mean, I, I just kind of was released. He said, what time was that? I said, I don't know, about 9.30, 10-ish, somewhere in there. I wasn't looking at the clock. They were all gathered around me and I kind of felt a force around me. And uh, he said, well, I want you to know we pray for you at 9.30. How many times do you get to feel the Lord's presence that the touch had come all the way down from heaven into this stupid carpet and pews and beds and I had blood they had poked me you know and I had a little blood stain I mean all this stuff from earth when the divinity comes and you're aware that God must have sent some angels in response to a request that came from here up to there and back down to me and you oh how glorious that is that's why we're here i hope that's why you're here today because you believe in the living god who is still answering prayers who is still responding to requests who is still opening an ear to the people who worship him and that's you amen to that now for the sermon what time is it? how much time do i Okay, now a word from our sponsor. <laughs> hey, what fun it is to travel to different parts of the world. I mean, different parts. So, you know, you guys are here from Jamaica. You're, you're a different part of the world. Some of you are down here from different parts. Minnesota, I know. Canada, another part of the world. Uh, we've got folks from, from different parts of the United States that have gathered here. Uh, we went on a vacation and I just wanted to kind of give you some highlights of things that I learned on the trip. I was trying to chill out. Uh, maybe you all realize what a wonderful thing we've got going on here, that this is indeed a gift from God, this church is. And um, that uh, I, I have helped to start this church. I didn't do it alone. There were 12 people, just like Jesus, 12 people <laughs> started, started with him. And uh, that we are growing. And there is a lot to do. And um, my wife is a teacher. She's very busy. She does all the church stuff and she does her stuff and she's taking care of me. I mean, this poor woman, I mean, she needs to have a, some kind of an award, right? I, I don't know. I don't have any money to buy a gold award, but I need to find some. Anyhow, we, she needs to chill. So that's why we go so long. I'm not gonna apologize. I'm just gonna tell you, we need the time. She needs the time off because she's busy from August 1st all the way through to July 31st. I mean, excuse me, uh, June 31st. And she's going, you know, 100 miles an hour and getting stuff done for all kinds of people. And, and myself too, I don't mind putting myself, uh, my ambitions to work for the church. So, but during that time, we don't just sit around and eat marshmallows and chocolate. We go visit other congregations when the Lord's Day comes up. And uh, we try to, you know, evangelize or talk to people about the Lord when we're on our journey. We're Christians uh, every day, not just Sunday, right? Isn't that what this is? 
So I'm a disciple of Jesus, and I, I want to encourage you to be a disciple every day. Not just today, not, not just uh, on Wednesday nights when you go to class, but every hour in between all of that. So when we're on vacation, we go to visit other churches, and one of the things I wanted to bring to your attention is the concept that we are part of a bigger whole. We're not alone. We're not some satellite up there in orbit that's all by ourselves with solar panels to try to keep us energized and keep in orbit. There, we're, we're part of a way bigger picture. And, and it was evident to us as we were on our journey looking for uh, fellowships, churches, that were something that we were familiar with. Well, the very first place we went was up in Lake City, Florida. You familiar with that? It's kind of up, right, 75 up there by I-10. We were uh, in a uh, campground close by, and that was one we actually knew somebody at. Uh, in the fellowships of the Christian churches and churches of Christ, there are uh, individuals that we have met and known uh, in our past or that are still meeting, as I have, uh, on our vacations or our times away. And this one was one that we knew the kids of Terry Tyree, the minister of the East Tampa Christian Church. So his, we had met him on one of his little um, activities that he did in the fall festival. So his daughter and, and her husband. Her husband is the minister there. I thought he was the youth guy, but he's the minister. So as we went there, we noticed that they had um, mm -hmm. a, a nice little building. It was nice and neat. We noticed that uh, they had a little different service coming up. Uh, he he met, it, met us at the door. I think his name is Sean. I could be Seth. wrong. What is it? Seth? Seth. Seth. See, we got, we got connection here. We got, we got networking. Well, Seth uh, met us at the door and explained to us who he was. And we said, we've, we've met you, but you might not remember. You know, we're from the New Life Christian Church in Valrico. So uh, Seth was now the senior minister there. And they were having uh, a youth day like we had last week. They had a youth day. They had they'd just been to Southeastern University down in Lakeland, Florida, and they had a youth event using the facilities there. And several of the Christian churches had their, their youth uh, there at the same time. And so they had a wonderful time uh, fellowshipping with other kids from other areas. Again, learning that they're not alone, that they're not in this all alone. Boy, is that important for our young people to know today, that we're not alone, that we have people that, that are the fellow Christians, that are disciples, trying to do the best we can in this life to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So we really enjoyed the testimonies of the children as they told us what they learned and how they grew in the Lord. We, we uh, learned some of the songs that they had learned at that particular encampment or whatever they called it, youth activity. And uh, we were looking around as the, you know, maybe some of you do that. Do any, of you, any of you look around when you're in worship? Just to see who's right down over here and who, who's in the back. You ever, you ever look around? Yeah, anyway, I, I did. I, I'm one of those observer guys. I'm looking around. And I see this old man behind me. And he claimed he was one of the elders there. And one of the founding people who, who was uh, instrumental in building the church building and, you know, getting, getting the church there and, and uh, all of that. So it was all, nice to meet all these people. Well, Michelle was uh, touched. Because the lady, his wife, but the elder's wife behind us, when we introduced ourselves, they said, Alan Detweiler, they said, we know that name. How do you know that name? You, you have no connection to me other than I, I kind of have a slight connection to you guys. Oh, you kidding me? We've been praying for you. I, and so the, apparently through Terry Tyree and their ministry, they had put out on the public, whatever it was, uh, Twitter, or however they do their account, that I needed prayer. That I was in the hospital and dying or whatever, that I needed prayer. So this church picked it up and they started praying for me. So lo and behold, this camping trip in Lake City, and I don't know who's there, there's this woman who said, we've been praying for you. And I said, guess what? The Lord said yes. And she was so pleased to see. So you see, when you look at that bulletin, you look at those names on there, maybe they're just names to you. But I was one of those names. And that lady was thrilled to see that one of those names 
on the bulletin became a person in front of her who had received healing from the Lord, who had received to the, the, the answer to that prayer. Uh, would we want him to go back into ministry and do his thing? And it was yes. Isn't that astounding? The Lord lives. Amen. The Lord's alive. He's not, he's not dead. He's still alive. And he's listening to you and to people. I didn't know she was doing that. I had no idea. I sensed a cohesion in their fellowship, though. One that had old people, young people, little babies. Matter of fact, Terry's daughter, she's got, she's got little kids, right? Little, little, are they twins? Two sets of twins, right? And aren't the little ones real little? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't rehearse this, you can tell. <laughs> they know better than me. Anyway, I just met him for a second. The kids were all there, and we went out to lunch, and so it was, it was over the time of the service. But I was left with some impressions that we are not alone, and I wanted to leave, leave you that with, uh, with that. Be a body of believers that is part of the greater whole. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Let's see what uh, the Apostle Paul says there in that letter to the Ephes Ephesus church at Ephesus as the prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received now now I don't want to apologize this is a familiar passage right this is not some obscure thing pulled out of the end of Revelation or some out of some Genesis or numbers or something like it this is a very familiar verse I don't want to apologize for bringing to you from time to time familiar verses that are meant to bring us back to focus is why we are doing what we are doing and who we are and who we are doing it for. I want to hit on those. I don't want to be a denominational preacher that has our four different doctrines. And I want to make sure every Sunday you're, you're well informed of the doctrines. But this is one here that has to do with our beginning and who we are and describes how we're to function. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Memorize that. You can use that often to describe who you are in the body of Christ. One body is the big picture. One body, not thousands of bodies, not, not thousands of denomina. One body of Christ. Being here with a sign out front and an IRS number, well, that, that gives us, for tax purposes, gives us the ability to, to buy things without paying tax. Isn't that great? But that's not the whole story. Is it? That's not really what a church is, is the sign and a, and a, and a tax number. Um, that's the world side of our church. That's what the world looks at. The, the bylaws we have, you know who that's for? It's not for us. I mean, we don't need, we have the Bible to tell us how to function. That's for the world. That's for the state of Florida. So they know if we fail, they, they want to know where the money's going. They want to know how are you going to dissolve this thing. And I was told that many years ago. That's all that's for. And, and so we use it many times as a second Bible. It's not. It's just out of a human's head. We put a lot of scripture in there. But yeah, and you're welcome to ours. Ours are uh, at the bottom of the, the table back there. Uh, get, you, get you a set if you don't know what our bylaws say. Um, but uh, when someone new comes to work with you, how long is it before you notice irritation? Somebody new comes into the church and, um, you know, some changes occur. And uh, you get a little bristly, right? You know, oh, somebody's trying to change everything around here. We're, we're trying, you know, we're going through a little transition. Well, guess what? In the fellowship, we've got to make room for that. In the early church, can you imagine 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost getting baptized, coming over there, and all these people from foreign countries with different cultures and different, even different languages, and they're all in the one body of Christ, and they're all just, man, that, that had to be a mess, right? And, uh, and later on, as you notice in Acts, there was a discussion about some of those not being 
minister to in a proper way. When someone new comes to work with it with you, how long is it before you notice it? How long is it before you find it a chore to put up with the changes that there that uh, that they present at the workplace? Think about it, guys. We like our comfort zone, don't we? Don't we like the way we always did it? You know, the way Grandpa always did it. The way Grand—I mean, I, that's just that's comfortable. But guess what? Are we in the business of being comfortable, or are we in the business of having people come in and becoming a part of our body, the power of the body of Christ, our our one body here on earth? We are. We got to make room. We've got to make accommodations. I venture to say that many times when new people come in, they're going to go, you know, I really like it, but I'd like to see this or I'd like to see that. As a pastor, Claire, I know you've experienced this in the past. Um, we get to be the filter of all those that, that have a better idea or have a, a greater way of doing things or a more effective way. I, for one, like to hear them. That doesn't mean that I'm going to accept them all and implement them all, but I like to hear them. I, I like to hear what you're thinking. So never think that in New, New Life Christian Church that you're not allowed to bring a new idea to the table. That is not true. You are allowed, you are encouraged to bring forth something that will help our youth, our seniors, our middle-aged people, our, our new people, our people that have been here, our seniors. Because we can't leave anybody out. We want to minister to every to everybody. But guess what? We have that takes effort. The Bible says make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So that means you and I have got to put some some elbow grease into it. We're gonna to have to make a little room in our own heart and in our own mind to make things work for not only ourselves. But for others, we've got to be unselfish, not selfish. We can't just contain this thing the way Grandpa always did it. We've got to make room. I venture to say, and I know you're going to kick you this, you can't be a preacher here anymore if you're going to say stuff like this. There is very little here today that resembles the first century church. Amen. The pews, the lights, the PA system, me being on a computer and typing up notes. Well, very little parking lot, cars. When I was in Jamaica as a missionary, this is not on the script, so i got to watch what I'm doing. There was a lot of people walking on Sunday mornings. And not all of them had shoes either. <laughs> so the little kids walking in there barefoot. You know, they had their best on, but they, you know, they didn't have good shoes. Anyway, it, it's, a, it's a concept that we get you know, used to this. And, and the pews are necessary, we can't have chairs. Or the chairs are necessary, we shouldn't have pews. Or we don't need a piano, we're, we're, we don't need an organ, we need all this other stuff. You know what we need? We need to exalt the King of Kings. We need with our hearts and our minds to recognize who we are in this great universe. And that is sons of the Most High God, children of of the Most High God, sons and daughters. I'm not, I'm not leaving you out. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now those people that we visited on that Sunday morning, I think, were delighted to see us, to see their prayers in the flesh. I think they were delighted to have visitors come in and encourage them that we like what we see, keep it up. And I hope that they continue to grow in their ambition to serve their community there. It's not like our, excuse me, our community. Val Rico is a big community. Val Rico and Brandon is a big community. We haven't hardly tapped the surface here, guys. We got a lot of work to do. Hey, the Lord's providing though, right? He's, he's given us increase. He's doing great. It's good to see you all here. I, I'd like to see more. Uh, there's a joke going around that the preacher count is always different than the actual count. The deacons might count 40. I got 140, you know, and, and my count, 140 people here. But, but I, I wish I wish there was. I, I, I pray to the Lord that I will be able to affect some soul. There's a full moon right around the corner, folks. I don't know what you think about a full moon, but it changes people's attitudes. 
not their minds so much, just their attitudes. Attitudes start going a little, a little left or a little right. They're not, they're not doing good. Um, we have to be careful to be kind at all times, even in a full moon, even when we're not feeling good, even when we're sick and just coming out of the hospital. We can't get grumpy. You know, sometimes I wake up grumpy and sometimes I let her sleep. Come on, Blair, that was funny. Glad that, that there was funny. I don't care. Sometimes I wake up grumpy and sometimes I let her sleep. We can't wake up grumpy and stay grumpy. You're the face of God to these people that don't know us and believe me. Hey, while I was in the hospital this time, I didn't tell you. Uh, I was on evangelism mode. Here I am. I don't know if I'm going to die or not, but I'm in the emergency room. And this nurse comes in. Very attractive, 30-year-old nurse. Just uh, very attentive and sweet and getting me everything I needed to, to do. And, uh, and I said, look, I have a DNR. If you don't know what that is, it's do not resuscitate. If I kick the bucket, don't be waking me up. Leave me alone. Nobody going to keep this body down. I'm going up, and I'm going to keep going up. And she said, okay. She said, um, you, so you, you believe that you want to go to heaven? I said, yeah, that's right. You know about heaven? She said, no. I said, uh, well, how, do you know about the Bible? Have you ever read the Bible? She says, no, I've never read the Bible. And this is a 30-year-old woman here in Tampa. It, you know, a very, I don't know, middle-of-the-road woman. And I, I said uh, just a couple things to her. I didn't want to you know, come and go, well, thou shalt not, you know, I just go ahead and start riot, reading of the riot act. But I was amazed that a woman that old in this community could say to me with a straight face that she doesn't know anything about the Bible. She doesn't know anything about Christianity. That the only thing about heaven is a generic sense. I mean, there are other faiths or different religions uh, uh, Muslims and Hindus and whatnot that, that have an idea of a heavenly place or a dwelling place at the end of life. But we Christians, we're, we're the ones to inherit that. And so I, I explained to her that I wanted to be there and why, because the Bible tells me about it. And, and she just was one of these people I thought, man, I wish I could stir something in her to get her, pique her curiosity to go to a scripture or here or that. I said, don't, have you never seen the movie, The Prince of Egypt about Moses, how he delivered the children of God from the hands of the Egyptian slavery and took them over through dry land, through the Red Sea and over to the promised land. You don't know anybody about any of that? Nope. I didn't want to be insulting. I said, what are you been sleeping under a rock? But I wanted to. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you, I think she's been sleeping under a rock. But in the meantime, there are people like that in our community. We got our work cut out for us. It's not automatic. It's not, hey, our church is better than that church. Come on over to our church. They go, what's a church? What's the difference between a church and a synagogue and a, uh, I don't know, what's the difference between a Bible and a Quran and a, and a this or that? What, what's the difference? So, all right, I've, I've, I've drifted and I'm sorry. Michelle researched an area, and then I'll, I'll have to close with this. You only get half the sermon when I come back. <laughs> I forgot how to keep myself temperate. Uh, Michelle was doing a little research. She said I did it. I don't know how it all worked out, but we were looking for the next Sunday, and we were in a place uh, called Ulaili, Ulala, Ulaili, Ulaili, Alabama. You know it? Oh, good. You know it. Well, there's a little church up there, and it uh, was a lot of churches, but there was one we, we, I, I read research on. And the church was called the uh, Christian Life Church. And I thought, well, that's pretty generic. Sounds like, you know something these days? People don't want you to know what their doctrine is. They just want to put a name up there, that sneak somebody in the back door, and whatever, whatever. You know, when you get in here, then you'll figure it out. Well, I'm not for that. I like, I like letting people know that we're a non-denominational church, that we are a Christian fellowship, um, and that um, um, we, are with, we are still affiliated with many churches in the restoration movement. And you've gotten your ears full of that stuff over, over the time. 
that we just want to bring it back to the New Testament. Whatever they wanted to do, the apostles' teaching, that's what we want to do. Well, this particular place, when I got into it, should have said um, Assembly of God or First, you know, whatever it was. And, and it wasn't bad. I mean, we went in there and we're just not used to a little, little bit of a, a, a difference in, in, the, in the service. But I wanted to fellowship with people, fellow believers. And we found them. We found fellow believers in Jesus. Um, one of the things I enjoyed about what they said on, online is they like to have a they like to have a service that was more contemporary. So that, that fits me. And the music was good. It was a little lengthy and kind of the same words over and over again. But I was in a good mood and it felt good. And I, I liked it. I think there was one song song. No, there probably two. But it was over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I was good with it. So while we were singing the songs, um, before the guy, the guy was a man, man preacher, I like that. I love that. Man preacher. I saw that on the web. I was like, okay. Wasn't a woman preacher. And uh, so I, I like to see a man up there preaching. I don't know how you guys felt. Last week, you got culture shock, didn't you? Because <laughs> it's all, all girls and kids. And there wasn't a man to be seen. This this week, I had Fred, I had Richard, and me, and, you know, Ian. And, and uh, we tried to mix it up with some ladies in the music and whatnot. But anyway, we're not against women here, believe me. You saw it last week. And uh, we want you to be used fully. But the, uh, the preacher's wife was sitting up front. I didn't know who the preacher was, but he got up and started saying a few words. And then all of a sudden, she went off and speaking in tongues. And she went and did her little her little thing. And we were, you know, she's around the front row, boom, you know, and doing her thing. And um, he was up on the stage. And everybody kind of quieted down and listened to what she was saying, including us. I didn't, I didn't know what she was saying. So then when she was done, she stopped, and then he interpreted what she said. It was a great, great message. Whatever, whatever he said was, we're here to glory God, give God the glory, and we're here to, to you know, pay homage to him. Whatever he said was supposed to be what she said in a, in a tongue. So uh, that was different for me. We, you know, I don't, I don't do that here. And I'd be glad to explain it to you why I don't do it. I, I'm not against it. I just, anyway, that's something for a future, future conversation. But what I, what I did take away was that uh, they, they wanted me to know that they were Christian people, that, that they believed in God. Now, the guy got up there and preached a great sermon. He had a lot of scriptures. They were a little denominational reference, maybe, but they were, they were trying to reinforce the belief system of the faith movement. And that's fine. That's, that's fine. That's, what would you expect them to do? What do you expect me to do? And so we enjoyed our stay there. But at the end, they were all getting slain in the spirit there. And I'm not, again, I'm not judging. I'm just observing. I came in off the street with a different culture. And this is what happened. And I thought, okay, this is good. Let them go through their exercise. People were repenting. People were being ministered to. And, um, but then it looked like every single member had to go through it. The preacher wasn't going to quit preaching until everybody came up on that stage and got hit in the head and they went and fell down. And so we thought, Michelle and I thought, you know what? This has gone on long enough. And I'm looking at the watch here for you. I'm looking at the clock right now as I speak to it. But I was looking at their clock and I'm going, oh man, I'm getting hungry and I gotta get, I can't, I can't handle too much more of this. So I, I, I went ahead and I said, hey honey, we're gonna have to make a dash because they're not gonna stop. And, and there was a lady next to us doing a beautiful job, praising the Lord, singing and whatnot. Well, apparently she had some stuff in her life she had to get rid of by, you know, getting slain in the spirit. And that worked for her. And then three or four and five and six. And so finally I said, Michelle, next one that goes up, we got we to just kind of quietly. I don't want to disturb her. But I, I, we need to get on with lunch and get on with the day. God bless you all. It's nice to be here. So we, we leave and we go, okay, what did what we experience? It was different. But it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. It's not something that I might want to bring back a lot of the cultural stuff into our fellowship. But it didn't kill me. And I was, I was pleased to touch base and let them know I'm a Christian, you're a Christian. And, and we have the same Lord. And boy, was it good to fellowship. Uh, we didn't get communion that day. Well, I did enjoy having it here today with you guys. And I am going to enjoy having it next week. And I hope you enjoy it. Breaking bread with us. And thinking of the Lord bringing him to service. So I'm going to skip down to the end, okay? Saved you three pages. You ever do that, Blair? You ever skip to the end? 
He's a, prof he's a professional. I'm just learning. Let me skip down here. It says, I've got to go for my four points. Josh, hang in here with me. Where's my all, all my points? Did she put all my points? First thing I learned, I sensed a body of believers that were part of a greater whole. We are not alone in this Christian church stuff or this Christianity stuff. We are not alone. Amen. There are others out there. We need to take our webpage seriously and put on stuff that people know who we are before they get here. So we don't shock them. We don't get them, you know, expecting, you know, things to happen here that probably aren't going to happen. We need to keep it updated, right? Amen. We need to put our stand on the Bible so that, that we all will know our doctrine here. We rely on the inspiration of the scriptures and we're not going to make it up. Now we can explain why we believe this scripture means this and doesn't mean that. We can go there. But people, when it's black and white, take it for what it is. It's the word of God. If and when you come to me and you say, you know, Alan, the earth swallowed up them, them Jews that made that golden calf and ate them up. Or they got killed by the sword, however that went. And, and uh, okay, let's explain that. That's not going to happen right here in the middle of our sanctuary. Probably things have changed. There's been developments in God's plan to where we're now in the, in the Christian. We're in the kingdom of God in the Christ side. We're not there in the kingdom of God where Moses was, was uh, the lawgiver. So, and we can worship God, worship in God's presence with or without air conditioning. I didn't get to that part because one of the Sundays I met with a preacher friend of mine and his wife. And we, we just had church there at the campground. We had a very simple, under the trees, beautiful morning by the lake. And we had communion and we discussed the scriptures. We had a great little time. We don't need the air conditioner. Oh, oh, so, oh some of you do. I'm willing to spend a lot of money so that some of you will come to church because it's air conditioned. I'm willing to do it. You, you willing to, uh, speaking of which, we could use some money. This is the side part. Dennis, this is for you. Where's Dennis? There he is. Dennis and I have been talking. We have money in the bank. You all have been faithful givers for a long time. Since we started four years ago, we have, we have not gone under any threshold. We've had a bid in savings, and that was uh, enabling me and others in our, in our congregation to make a decision to purchase this building. Well, if we can do that, then maybe we can do this. We couldn't do any of it without God. So recently, we have had to fix two of the air conditioners in here that went, that went down. Their compressors went out, and that was a couple thousand bucks that came out of our, right off the top of our savings. We had another air conditioning back in the classroom. Uh, you know, we went to the Creole speaking church and they use that for classrooms before they come in here. So there was no AC back there. Can't rent a place that doesn't have air conditioning. I know what I said <laughs> under the trees, but practical matters. We had to spend another, I think $2,500 there. And we have another one on its last legs uh, we're about to rent space to a school, uh, our classroom wing. We're going to have a discussion before we make any decisions. You'll be in the discussion. You will have a say, I, I guarantee you. But in the meantime, we've had to spend, I would dare, dare say, upwards of almost $10,000 in unexpected expenses this summer. And it's taken our savings from up here down, down to down here. If any of you have some loose change, and you wouldn't mind giving us a special donation toward our air conditioning in here. I'm, I'm almost a hypocrite. You know, I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth. I'm saying we don't need it to worship God. But if you're going to reach people that have skin on in, in Central Florida in the summertime, you might want to get air conditioning and make sure it works. The, the um, well, I'm, I'm doing everything I can as a pastor, as a businessman, as a person that God enables to see things a little differently maybe than you do, is to lead us into a place where we can have this nice building, where we can turn on the lights and keep the electricity on, where we can do things uh, as, as a group and share with other churches so they can worship God in the way they want to worship God, worship Christ. No, we don't have any Hindus in here. We, everybody's got to be a Christian. Do you get me? Do you get my drift? 
We could, we could use some help. You guys have been great with the kids. The kids were fully financed for camp and all that. And I can't thank God enough for you guys. You guys are amazing. The small group we have is potent. Man, we are strong. Thought I'd throw it out there in case you have some spare change going on. I'm doing the best I can, and I know most of us are doing that the best we can. The invitation today is this. I'm here to ask you to check your heart. I'm here to make sure that you know that if you were like me and you were on the table and you were just groggy with anesthesia and you heard the nurses saying, call his wife. If you were confronted with the idea that your days on earth were done, that you didn't have another day to fix a relationship, you don't have another day to tell a child you love them, or to repair relationships, or, or catch up on old debts, or, or whatever it would be that you need to do before you go and be with the Lord. Check yourself now, because I've got news for you. You don't know when the day or hour when the Lord is going to return. As if you even know how many more days are in your life that you have that you can count on. We just don't know. Oh, it's nice when we don't know because then we can figure, ah, it's infinitum whenever. But guess what, folks? You know, some of you are walking around with stuff you don't even know you got. I know what I've got. I might have even more than that. And I don't mean this to depress you. I just want you to be ready for the day when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. You don't want to hear it. Depart from me. You're not ready. Send him back. <laughs> you, know? you want to hear a well done. And I want, I want as, as your pastor, as, as one of your mentors here, Christian mentor, I want you to be ready for that day. And don't tell me you know when that's going to be or you are you are got time to, you know, before the plane hits the ground to jump up and you'll be okay. That don't work. You know that doesn't work. So I'm imploring you now in the name of Jesus Christ to make it right with him and make it right with those around you and prepare yourself to meet your God because that day is coming. This is not a threat. It's not a scare. I look forward to it. I look forward to the day. When the lights go dim, and I hear again, better call his wife. Yeah, call her. The, the, the will is signed. The, the life insurance is paid up. And I've already said my goodbyes and my I love yous, and I took care of everything I need to take up. The only thing left for me is to meet my Lord and to get on with the next life, eternal life. It's waiting for you. Whatever's in your way, get it out of the way. Get ready. I'm here to help you. If you're, if you're a prayer away, let me pray with you. If you haven't been baptized, if you haven't, if you haven't accepted your Lord Jesus as your Savior, if you haven't repented of your of your past life and, and adopted a new one in Him, this is the day. This is the time.